Welcome. In this video, I'm going to talk about Section 1 from Chapter 15, or Option D, on medicinal chemistry. So humans have known for a long time that chemicals with medicinal properties can be found in plant tissue, extracts of animal organs, and minerals. And records from Egypt, Greece, and China from back as far as 3,000 years ago show medical records. And we've known for a long time that medical knowledge within a culture is passed on to the next generation in some manner. Perhaps the greatest development of the 20th century was learning to make synthetic molecules for specific diseases, or what we now know as targeted drugs and vaccines. This has wiped out diseases like smallpox, polio, and measles, and it's allowed people to survive diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. But it's also created challenges like the abuse of drugs, antibiotic resistance, appearance of new diseases and possible pandemics, unequal availability and access to medications, especially in developing countries, and radiation hazards and disposal issues from using nuclear medicine or diagnostic treatments. The human body functions because of a balance between thousands of intricate chemical reactions that occur simultaneously 24-7, and the sum of all these processes is what we know or call metabolism. But our metabolism is constantly under attack from injuries, genetic abnormalities, environmental causes, changes due to aging, as well as microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, parasites, etc. The human body also has an intricate system of defense against any attacks or invaders. And the body's response to any attack is described as its line of defense and we often describe them as the symptoms of our disease. For example, allergy season, people get runny eyes, runny nose, you know, itchy eyes. That's your line of defense trying to protect you from the things you're allergic to. Or when you get a gnat in your eye, your eye waters like crazy to try and flush the gnat out. When you're fighting a bacterial infection, your body temperature might rise and you have a fever to combat it. So any medicine we take should maximize and supplement our body's natural line of defense. The terms medicine and drugs are often used interchangeably, but they don't mean quite the same thing. Drugs means any chemical that affects how the body works, and it may be for better or for worse. It may include illegal and legal substances. But by definition, medicine is a substance that improves health. There's always, um, they are always a beneficial drug. They might be natural, they might be synthetic, but they're going to be beneficial. So some other terminology, therapeutic effect is a measure of the benefits provided by a medical treatment. So what effect, what therapy does it provide? Placebo effect is a measurable, observable, or felt improvement in health that's not due to treatment. And we know about one-third of all patients who believe they're taking a therapeutic drug will show improvement when, in fact, they're not taking any medication. And this is especially true of pain relievers, and science simply has no explanation for it. It's not specific to a gender, etc. There's just no explanation other than positive thinking, I guess. It means all drug studies should be done in what we call a double-blind fashion so that neither the patient nor the doctor or researcher knows who has the drug and who does not. Drug delivery method or administration depends on several factors like the chemical nature of the drug, the condition of the patient, and the most effective delivery to get it to the target site. Some drugs, especially proteins like insulin, are broken down by the digestive system, so they can't be taken orally, so more often they're going to be injected. Some people have trouble swallowing pills, especially elderly people, or obviously anyone who's unconscious or in a coma. So the common delivery methods are oral, which would likely be a pill or a liquid that you swallow, inhalation, which will be a vapor like for a nebulizer, or you smoke it. Um, there are both legal and illegal reasons and substances for smoking. And these will be, whether it's a vapor or smoking, it's going to be a systemic effect, meaning the whole body and brain will feel the effects. Skin patches, also known as transdermal, goes directly from the skin to the blood. This is like nicotine, motion sickness, and pain patches. Suppositories, which are the opposite of oral, are inserted into the rectum, and they're used often for digestive treatment in hemorrhoids, or if the patient is nauseous and you don't want to um, upset the stomach further or have them vomit up the pills, or 
depending on the condition of the patient, sometimes a rectal is just easier. Eye or ear drops is delivered directly to the eye or the ear and almost always that's to treat an infection of that organ. And the last common method is parenteral or by injection, which is what it means. And you can inject into three different sites. It can be intramuscular, which is into the muscle, which most vaccines are, and then they're slow to take effect, slow to find their way into the blood system. Intravenous or IV, which is into the blood directly, so it's going to be the fastest delivery method. So local anesthetics like Novocaine are injected right into the bloodstream or when an IV is hooked up. And then subcutaneous means under the skin, like dental um, injections or injecting insulin. It's not as fast as IV, but it's much easier to administer so people can self-administer this. And it's a pretty quick response. The last thing to talk about is bioavailability. Bioavailability just means that not all of an administered drug reaches its target site in the body. And that's because not all the drug actually gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And metabolic processes like digestion may break down or alter some of the drug even if it does reach the bloodstream. So the fraction of the drug that actually reaches the bloodstream is known as bioavailability. This means IV drugs have 100% bioavailability. It's all going to get into the bloodstream since it's injected directly. So we use that as the basis of the comparison. What percent reached the bloodstream compared to if it had been injected directly? Dosage, then, is how much of the drug to administer, and it's going to depend on the bioavailability, how much is actually going to get to where it needs to go, which depends in part on the delivery method chosen. This graph here shows how much more drug is available and how much quicker. You can see that in the first hour, the uh, plasma concentration for whatever drug they're looking at here was over 60% for an IV administration, where it didn't peak with oral administration until two hours, and it was less than 20% at that point. Other factors um, that affect bioavailability, the delivery method, obviously, and generally a dose is four times greater if you take it orally than in an IV. And that's because of something called the first pass effect, which means that before a drug reaches the bloodstream, the drug first passes through the digestive system, where it's a 60 to 80 percent of the drug may get removed or broken down. Other factors then are solubility of the drug. To get into the blood requires polarity of the drug, but to cross membranes, which are usually lipid or fatty, especially into the brain, requires a nonpolar molecule. So it depends on solubility. Does it have both those features? Is it more strongly polar or nonpolar? And then finally, functional groups in the drugs. Some functional groups, especially H plus and OH minus, which are acids or bases, can have a large effect on the bioavailability because their solubility depends on the pH of the blood and the different parts of the body. So that's an introduction to medicinal chemistry, some of the uh, terminology and delivery methods.